Thank you everyone for being here together this morning. This congregation has dealt with more than its fair share of loss uh, over the last uh, month or so uh, to Jean and Mary, uh, to Angela, to now Diane and all of their families. Uh, we love you and we are, as uh, Brother Ken mentioned in Bible class, uh, generally good at being unified and supporting one another. And uh, these are the moments where we need it uh, just as often as any other. And uh, thank you for being there for each other. <clears throat> We're doing our... Just a second. <laughs> God damn it. I'm sorry. Where can I go? <laughs> There's no curtains to draw. <laughs> There's nowhere to hide. There's not even a closet to go into. I don't even have a Kleenex. There's a Kleenex right there. Thank you, Joey. I suppose it's the cumulative effect. I saw several other... Uh, Eyes being patted this morning. Um, we love all of you, and I hope you understand that. Our year-long focus is on purity. Uh, the elders uh, came to me near the end of last year, as you may remember from the first sermon uh, in January, and asked me to focus this year on the issue of purity. And what a, a timely theme. As we look around at our world at the... Uh, movement away from God's standard of morality, God's standard of right and wrong, what is pure and what is impure. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I had thought that January's sermon on the definition of purity was, was sufficient. And I thought, well, you know, each section has, you know, two months dedicated to it, so... I thought this month we might even forego a discussion of purity, but I started thinking about the nature of definitions. Uh, here's our lineup, by the way, as we go through. Uh, we're going to talk, as I mentioned, uh, January, February on defining purity. As we move forward over the next uh, two months, that is uh, March and April, spiritual purity. And then we'll move on to mortal purity, verbal purity, and continue with doctrinal and finally mental purity. But in defining purity, I, I thought we had done a sufficient job, and then I started thinking about the nature of, of definitions. And I started thinking about just how important, how we define terms like purity, how important that is. And it was the course of those thoughts that came about, or that brought about, this sermon this morning. And so we're going to talk about defining purity just a little bit more, but, but we're going to start more broadly. We're going to start by thinking about just how important definitions are. Uh, can you think back to elementary school? Did you have to do definitions? Vocabulary? I still make my students in, in their notebooks for English class one section if they do it properly is devoted to a running list of vocabulary terms. 
And every test that I've ever given in literature has begun with matching vocabulary. Definitions really are important. And here's one reason why. Words are only as meaningful as the concepts behind them. Have you ever thought about that? You're sitting in this morning what we call a pew, right? Well, we could call it anything. When I say the word pew, you understand what it is you're sitting in because that's what we've all come together somehow and accepted as the definition for what it is you're standing in, or sitting in, rather, and, and the word to describe that concept. I've got on the board this morning a quote from Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, one of the most famous plays of all time. And in the, the, one of the most famous scenes and, and sections of that play, there is Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? You remember Juliet asked that. Why are you Romeo? Why do they call you that? You see, the main problem between Romeo and Juliet had to do with their two families, the Montagues and the Capulets. And there was a feud between those families that had existed for generations. And so Juliet bemoans the fact that he is of one family and she of another and that those families fight. And so her, her thought process is, if we could only name each other something different, and then this classic statement is made. What's in a name? A rose by, called by any other name would smell as sweet. What does he mean by that? If you called a rose something else, it would still be whatever it is that we now recognize as a rose. What if you called a rose a chair? And you went out, Valentine's Day, gentlemen, is just a few days away. I hope you understand that. I hope you remember that. That's my friendly announcement that, that uh, Valentine's Day is quickly approaching. But if you went out and bought a dozen chairs, right now that would be quite odd, unless your wife really needed a dozen chairs. But if, if we called whatever a rose is now, if we called that a chair, then you would have no problem going out and getting a dozen chairs and wrapping them in a nice uh, package, uh, uh, arranging them well and giving them to your wife. You see, and that's what Juliet is, is, is trying to illustrate for us, what Shakespeare is, is observing, that words are only as important as the concepts that are connected to them. And we take for granted that we understand this word is connected to this concept. But what happens when somebody tries to change the concept connected to a word? And if you look at our world today, that is the battleground. Because here's truth number two about definitions. Whoever makes the definition has the power. Now think about just how important that statement is. If I can define what a word means, I now have power over that concept. And I can leap into your mind and I can take control of that concept in your mind. And you don't have to, to watch the news very long. You don't have to read very far in the newspaper. You don't have to scroll very far down on your news feed in social media to realize that the battleground today has to do with words and their definitions. Let me give you just a few battleground words. I, I teach uh, literature... And sometimes we read a classic work and it has the word gay in it. And all of my students say, ooh, look at that word. And I say, no, no, there was a time when that meant happy. That's all it meant. It was a very uh, innocent word that had no connotations whatsoever as it does now. What about gender? There was a time when of all of the things that were taken for granted in our world, what gender meant was very cut and dry, black and white, male, female. It was binary, right? But now that definition is under attack. What about masculinity? What word do you most associate with masculinity today? A word that precedes it. Toxic. Toxic masculinity. If I were to throw that word out to people my age and younger, most would associate those two words together. Our world has sought to redefine what it means to be a man. Masculinity. What about life? 
The abortion debate is largely dependent on what you define life as. And how you define life, living and dead, living and non-living, might very well affect your view on what makes a person a person. What about marriage? How do we define it? And connected with how we define it, how important is it? I mean, after all, I mean, we live together a certain amount of time. Isn't that the same thing? And doesn't that have the same uh, uh, rights and privileges as anything else, right? And, and marriage shouldn't be defined as between one gender and another gender. Let's redefine it. What about fascism? Would my great-grandparents have had a different definition of fascism than how people try to use it today? What about hate? Hate speech. Right? What does it mean to really hate? Might that have been different in previous generations than it is today? What about racism? Now that's a word that's as important now as it's ever been. But it's often difficult to define because it's, it's militarized. Right? Right? And I'm not saying that we have to believe one thing or another on every one of these things, but what I'm saying is, what is the battle today? The battle is, what do these words mean? And I could put 15 or 20 more on the board this morning that are battlegrounds. We're fighting over concepts. We're fighting over definitions. We're fighting over what these things mean and the ideas and the concepts that are brought with them. The truth about definitions. Number one, words are only as meaningful as the concepts behind them. How you define them matters. And number two, if you can be the one who defines a word, you take control of that word. And we see it in social situations. We see it in political situations. We see it in religious situations. I mean, I could throw the word baptism up there. We have the word baptism in our vocabulary because the, the translators of certain translations of the Bible didn't want to put immersion. They didn't want to acknowledge what the word actually meant. And so they came up with a new word that they could define however they chose. You see, that's how important definitions and concepts are. That's the truth about definitions. And I want you to know this morning that Satan has taken that power and has used it, has adopted it as one of his tools. And from the very beginning, Satan has known that if he can control a definition, if he can control a concept, if he can control an idea, then he can assume the power in our lives. We see that throughout the Bible. What are Satan's tools as it relates to words and definitions? Number one, Satan is adept at redefining terms. We've talked about some of the terms just a moment ago that are seeking to be redefined. But Satan has always wanted to redefine terms. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. And we'll revisit this passage in just a moment and look at verse 21. But if you look at verse 20, God pronounces a woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light, light for dark, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. What are they doing but redefining terms? What is now defined as evil, well now it's good. What was now defined as good, well now that's evil. And if we can redefine what something is, then we can assume the power in a person's life and in their moral decision making. Satan has become adept at redefining terms. Unfortunately, any of us who has lived a number of decades can look back and see just how drastically things have been redefined. And it seems to be happening more and more quickly every generation. Satan's tool is number one, redefinition. Number two, uh, oh, by the way, this is, this is illustrated in 1 Samuel chapter 15. You can turn there this morning. I thought of this passage when I thought about Isaiah 5 and verse 20 because uh, Saul, the king of Israel, used redefinition 
in his discussion with Samuel. Now God had said through Samuel that everything was to be destroyed of the Amalekites. They were to be completely destroyed when Israel went up against them. But Saul had a different idea in verse 7 of 1 Samuel 15. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people. But verse 9, he spared Agag, the best of the sheep, of the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. So he very obviously disobeyed, right? Obviously, Saul disobeyed. But I want you to notice in verse 13 what Saul says in response to Samuel. In verse 13, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What did Saul do? He redefined in his own mind what obedience was. God had very clearly outlined the definition of obedience in this instance. Destroy everything. But Saul had redefined it to the extent that he could stand before Samuel the prophet, the very one who had given the legislation, and he could say, I have obeyed. He redefined what obedience was in his own mind so that he could in clear conscience stand before God. And isn't that what people do today? Isn't that what Satan convinces us we can do? I'm going to redefine what's right. I'm going to redefine what's wrong to include what I want to do. And if I want to do it, I will redefine it so that it becomes okay. Well, friends, if we're going to talk about purity through this year, we've got to find a place where we understand what is what. But Satan seeks to redefine what is good and what is evil. Number two, Satan uses confusion. See, he doesn't really have to convince us completely. Really all Satan has to do is just make it murky. And if he can make us uncertain, then I think in many instances he has won. So when it comes to defining terms like purity, maybe if he can just confuse the waters. John 18, 38, and I know that there's confusion. Ken always talks about opinions, you know, and he, he shares with Thomas Warren's statement about you having every right to be wrong, you know, as the next person. So everybody has an opinion about whether or not Pilate was sincere in asking this question to Jesus, what is truth? But isn't that what so many people ask today? What is truth? If, I, if Satan can get somebody to a point where they don't know which way is up and down, then he has won. He's made us vulnerable as it relates to truth and error. Satan didn't engage in a long discourse with Eve in the Garden of Eden, did he? He just had to muddy the waters long enough for her to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And once he did that, that was all he needed to do. Just confuse the situation long enough for sin to enter in. And that's what Satan has tried to do. We need to understand that, that even our young people who are reared in the church, who are, are brought to Bible class, who are taught right and wrong, even they have trouble deciphering what's right and wrong because they are bombarded constantly with improper definitions of what's right. And so it becomes so difficult even for quote-unquote good kids from quote-unquote good families, which would probably include all of us here this morning, all of you within the sound of my voice. It's hard for us to navigate because it's so easy to get confused. Well, Satan wants to do that. Number one, if he can redefine terms. And number two, if by doing that he can confuse us then he's accomplished his purpose. Or number three, what if he can just personalize it? Here's what would really be great. What if I could just define my terms however I wanted to? What if I didn't need anybody else to define them for me? What if I didn't need any standard to tell me what one thing meant and what another thing meant and what was right and what was wrong? What if I could convince people of what we call pluralism? 
There can exist two truths that are in opposition to each other about the very same thing and both of them can be right. Wouldn't that be awesome? What if 2, could two, two plus 2 could equal 3 and 4 at the same time? Well, man, that would be great. And I could just choose which one best applied to me. When's, have you filled out a, an online form lately? The gender drop-down menu is getting longer and longer. <laughs> Male, female, rather not say what I am today, what I was yesterday, what I might be tomorrow. You know, I don't, I don't know, it keeps getting longer and longer. But you see, we have to include everyone's potential opinion because we live in a pluralistic world where we should be able to define things however we choose. I told you Isaiah 5.20 and I said we would visit verse 21. Verse 20 says, Woe unto those that call good evil, evil good, sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet. Um, light, dark, dark, light, right? That's redefining terms. But verse 21 says, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Not only are there people who are seeking to redefine terms for everybody, there's people who are saying, Look, I'm just going to decide whatever I want to. And so we've got this opportunity that the world gives us to define standards of right and wrong however we see fit. And so having a discussion on things like purity and morality becomes increasingly difficult when we live in a pluralistic society where everybody can believe everything all at once and all be right. In Titus 1 and verse 15, notice what Paul says to Titus concerning the idea of purity. Under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, notice this, is nothing pure. Are you telling me that, that my perspective will skew what I believe is right and wrong? Surely nobody is going to define things if given the opportunity in a way that suits them. Well, of course, that's what unfortunately all of us do if given the opportunity. If you ask me, what should the speed limit be on X road? I'm going to make it fast as fast as I can go comfortably. My wife is going to make it slow. As slow as she can go patiently. Okay? So, if you ask me my truth about the speed limit, it's going to be different than her truth about the speed limit. But what if neither she nor I is the one who determines the speed limit on that road? What if there's another force? Well, don't I have to recognize that? But you see, Satan convinces us that we can personalize truth and make it whatever we want it to be. Or maybe he just confuses us so we don't know. Or maybe he convinces us that his definition is right. And Satan uses those tools to muddy the waters relative to defining terms that are of the utmost importance. But this morning, as we conclude, I want you to think about really two things as we move forward this year in a discussion of purity. Number one, I want you to understand that definitions matter. You say, well, none of this stuff's really important, right? Well, what we determine is right and wrong is important, it does matter. And we need to understand that. In Hebrews 5, there's a discussion of the weak and the strong. And it's in the context of those who are knowledgeable and those who are not knowledgeable. Verse 11 of Hebrews 5. He's talking about Melchizedek in verse 10. And verse 11 says, "...of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing." For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now notice this. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. People who know the definitions. The goal is for each one of us to reach a full, mature spiritual age. 
And what does it mean to be fully mature spiritually, but to be able to understand the definition of right and wrong? That's the most fundamental character trait of a spiritually mature person. They can discern good and evil. So if we're incapable of discerning good and evil, well, we're in trouble, aren't we? Definitions matter. That's one of the the hallmarks of spiritual maturity, is being able to define good and evil. So definitions matter in your spiritual life and mine, and the reason they matter most importantly is because God determines the definitions. You see, there is an objective standard. And as it relates to purity in particular, God is the sole determiner of what's right and wrong. You see, as we move forward in a discussion of purity, your opinion and mine carry no weight. Only God's definition of purity really matters. Why? 1 John 3 and verse 3, Every man that has this hope in him does what? Purifies himself based on what standard? Even as he, that's God in that context, is pure. I am pure only based upon the standard that God Himself sets for purity. And I am not pure unless I measure up to that standard that He has set. To put it another way, remember we talked about when we defined purity, the connection between purity and holiness. And Peter had this to say, because it is written, God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I have set the standard of what I expect holiness to be, You achieve that standard. Dear friend, as we look at the world around us, at the swirling changes and challenges that are presented, I want us to understand a few things. Number one, the world is not hopeless. Please don't take anything that I've said as a woe is us statement about the hopelessness of the world. Dear friend, Satan has always tried to redefine terms. He's always tried to confuse us. He has always attempted to convince us that we are in charge of defining our own standards. That has never changed. And number two, I want us to understand just how important it is to focus on God's definitions of all things, but of purity in this instance in particular. And so this morning, and as we move forward this year, as we focus on purity, let us focus on letting God define what is and is not pure. But may we focus on something connected but separate for just a moment. Just as God defines what is pure and impure, So God defines who is saved and who is not saved. So God defines who is right with Him and who is not right with Him. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, The word that He's spoken unto us, the same shall judge you in the last day. The same word that we have before us this morning will be opened up in connection with the book of our lives, and we will stand before God, and we will be judged, as John reminds us in the book of Revelation, according to the things that are written in the books. And you and I will stand before God, and we will have to answer, not for what we define as right and wrong, but for what He defines as right and wrong. And we will only be righteous based on His definition of what that actually means. With that in mind, shouldn't it be imperative for us to find out what God says it means to be saved? 
Jesus made this simple statement to His disciples when He sent them on the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Go you therefore and teach all nations, He said in Matthew's account, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Mark's account, He says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's pretty simple. It's God's definition. If you're willing this morning to believe that Jesus is the Christ. If you're willing in conjunction with that to repent of your sins, why? Because Jesus said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. If you're willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, why? Because if we confess Him, He'll confess us. If we deny Him, He'll deny us, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. If you're willing to do those things, let it culminate in your immersion in Christ. Baptized into Him, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Contacting His blood at His death. And raised to walk in a new life. And so this morning, if you've not done those things, won't you today? But dear Christian, our obligation doesn't end there. We are obligated to live as He directs. To take up our cross daily and follow Him. This morning has impurity entered into your life. Sin as God defines it. How do you find forgiveness for that? Repent. Confess that sin as publicly as it's known. Let us pray with you and for you that you may be forgiven. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. James chapter 5 reminds us of that. This morning, are you pure? Pure by the blood of Christ. Your robes washed white by His blood. Are you faithful to Him, dear Christian? If not, let us help as together we stand and sing.